You're tuned to 1520 WCAT Radio, and it's time now for the Avid Reader Show with your host, Sam Hankin. Sam will offer reviews and interviews of some of the more interesting books and authors of today, and now Sam Hankin. Afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Avid Reader. Today, our guest is Julia Glass. As many of you may know, probably do know, her debut novel, Three Junes, won the National Book Award for Fiction in 2002. In her second novel, The Whole World Over, um, she set her tale in the same fictional universe, um, kind of, as the first book. And in her latest novel, which is And the Dark Sacred Night, which was published by Pantheon Random House in April of this year, Julia continues, in a way, um, her literary life with some of the characters from her first and second novels. So welcome, Julia, and thanks so much for being here today. Well, thank you for having me on the show, Sam. You're welcome. So to begin with, and we were talking a little bit before, this new novel, just so readers know, it, it also if you haven't read Three Junes or uh, The Whole World Over, it stands on its own, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, j- just as The Whole World Over stands on its own and you don't have to have read Three Junes first. Yeah, and, I, and as I was also saying to you earlier, thinking about And the Dark Sacred Night in relation to Three Junes, in a way it's more of a prequel than a sequel because you get a lot of backstory for the characters that you meet in Three Junes, um, as well as encountering them some years later. Uh, But absolutely, you could read this one first. And then if you do, I hope that would lead you to read Three Junes next. Yeah, I I think it definitely would. As a matter of fact, before I start blabbing like I tend to do, why don't you just give a little background of this story, and then I can ask you questions or talk about why it could be looked at as a prequel. Okay, well, like all of my fiction, uh, this is a book with multiple points of view and multiple intertwining plot lines, um, a lot of backstory, uh, and it, as well as bringing back some of the stories from Three Junes and the whole world over, it introduces completely new characters, including the protagonist who is named Kit Noonan, and he is a 42-year-old man who's in a fairly stuck place in his life. He's an art historian who has been denied tenure and has been out of work for a couple of years. He's married with nine-year-old twins, and obviously there's a lot of financial pressure on him. And his wife, who's a very strong-minded person, believes that one thing he really needs to do in his life is to go out and find to discover the identity of his biological father because his mother had him as an unexpected baby when she was 17 years old and she kept him rather than put him up for adoption raised him on her own very lovingly she married twice uh, over the subsequent years but she has never told him who his biological father is and his wife really believes that He'll be able to go forward in his life uh, in a more fulfilling way if he knows that. So he's basically booted out of the house to go off on this quest. And one of the things that I really enjoyed about this was setting out to write a quest novel. I've always admired that genre. Of course, I'm incapable of telling a straight arrow story, but the beauty of the quest story is that while the hero or the heroine always does find the object of the quest, it's what he or she encounters along the way that really constitutes the meat of the story. So that Kit Noonan, you know, meanders from here to there, both physically and psychologically, in in the course of making this discovery, uh, was, um, you know, fit very well with the kind of novels that I've written before. And it's funny, I'm always interested in epigraphs, some a lot of people just kind of slide by them. But your epigraph from Into the Woods, um, um, Stephen Sondheim mm-hmm. uh, and, and uh, James, I guess it's, is it Lapine or Lap- James Lapine. Lapine. I think. Yeah, I think it, it looks like, <laughs> I guess it's Lapine. Um, uh, what your epigraph is, is every knot was once a straight line. And, you know, when you think Every it, knot was once a straight rope. A straight rope, sorry. Right. My mistake. Um, it, the thing about that is that's it, pretty much life, isn't it? I mean, well, that's true. That could be applied to just about everything in our lives. Well, I always think of the road less traveled, and we constantly veer off, you know, constantly veer off on one road or another. 
and then it, you know you're born you're born this buddha baby and then you travel along and you wind yourself all, all up unless you can remember unless you continue to be a buddha <laughs> right <laughs> i am so far from being a buddha and so are all my characters <laughs> oh yeah there's a lot of dysfunctionality in here oh yes <laughs> except Sa sandra is not sandra i really love sandra because you know she's... well thank you because I, she's been um she's been savaged by a couple of critics who, who thinks that that what kit noonan ought to do is not go off and find the father but actually dump his wife <laughs> what dump his wife he's just he he's like all guys he, he wants to sit on the couch with a remote control <laughs> fritos and dip and just watch whatever all weekend long. No. Well, he wants to sit on sit on the couch with that big stack of art books. That you know. Yeah, right. Light difference, but yeah, yeah I'm sure Even, the remote would be out there too. Well, he well, should have. Hey, no, she's a strong woman. She is. Yeah, she he should have listened to Daphne and gone into electrical engineering. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that what you wish you'd gone into? Sam? No, 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 no. <laughs> but I don't know if I would have gone up and you know decided. Well, you know the other thing is this. I just finished reading the Goldfinch. You know. Oh, you did. Yeah. Oh. And um, I thought it was a great book, but the bottom line is, you know, his mother died. That's the bottom line. His mom died. Mm -hmm. And in your book, and I don't mean this, it's not going to sound right. He's searching for something, and that's what it's about. Yeah, and, it's a search. It's about a search. And the question is, is it is it important? Why don't you say what he's searching for so I don't spoil it if you think it's spoiling it. Well, he's he's searching for the identity of this of this father, okay. that, of, of the man who um, who conceived him, um, and obviously with whom his mother had uh, an encounter when she was a teenager, and it was one that turned her life upside down because she was a very gifted young musician um, at an elite uh, music camp in Vermont, and that's actually where. The, the story opens. I had originally opened the story with Kit, from Kit's point of view. But in the end, I decided that <clears throat> I would give the reader snapshots, in a way, of the summer of the summer that Kit was conceived, of his mother as this young, idealistic, talented, and very hardworking teenage musician, but, you know, a girl, and, uh, and about the boy she meets, um, who is, as you know, um, a character that you meet in Three Junes as an older man. You know, what's interesting is um, that it was great the way you began it because it really kind of sucks you into the first chapter, and then all of a sudden you're tumbled into this other universe and you're already thinking. Because it's such a nice first chapter, um, you know, out on the rock and them meeting and the fact that it's music and making fun of their teachers, and, it, and, and they, she, they both seem so attractive. And... Um, the interesting thing about that backstory, uh, if you can call it that, is that uh, unlike lots of books about a romance, she's the pursuer uh, in a really intense way. And I thought that was right. really cool. Well, you know, I, I thought about that, too. I thought, you know, teenage boys are, <laughs> and I have a teenage boy, um, <laughs> and I hope he's not perceived this way, but many teenage boys are perceived as, predators of a sort. I mean, just because of they are coming into the full force of their hormones. But for reasons that become very clear, uh, the, the boy that she meets, and I, I will just say that it's Malachi Burns, um, the music critic from Three Junes, he's obviously to the reader, but not to her, because she's so young, very ambivalent about uh, his sexuality. I sort of hate to tie it up in a bundle like that, but um, but she falls for him, and and he is drawn to her, and and what happens between them is passionate, but it's also a little sad. And uh, and I did think, well, setting up this story where the teenage girl is is in a way the aggressor or the seducer, um, how how does the reader perceive that? And and I thought to myself, you know, I don't have to be bound by any sort of sexist ideas that it's always the guy who, who, who makes the advances. So, so actually it was an interesting thing for me to take on. And I, and I will say that I had actually written a great deal more about life at that music camp, much of which hit the cutting room floor because I'm a big overwriter. And when I, I like to joke that when I turn my books into my editor 
they all have delusions of war and peace. <laughs> and, uh, it's my editor's job to talk me down, and it, she always does. It would have made a great novel just set in that setting, especially when you kind of reprise it, reprise it at the end. Mm-hmm. You know, when they come and visit the same site where all this happened so right, many years ends, before. Right, yeah, sort of where it begins. Yeah, and it's the the amazing thing is like 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 you're. I mean, they're sixteen year olds, and I didn't, as the reader, and and I, you know, that's who you're writing it for. I didn't necessarily look at him as not being sure, but almost as if, as he says in, in that chapter, I'm not good enough. You're too good for me, which is kind of a, maybe it's a cop-out. Maybe he's saying that. To well, it's co- a kind of, it's a confusion. You know, I, I guess I should just say, you know, he's very confused, I think. Um, and, I mean, he's gay, ultimately. Uh, I, this is not a spoiler, especially, you know, for people who are familiar with that character from Three Junes. I mean, he grows up to be... Um, you know, a man who is openly gay. Uh, and I've been very touched, well, moved is a better word, over the years by close gay male friends telling me the stories of how and when they came out, not just to other people, but to themselves. And, and what it's like to go through a hormonal, you know, the hormonal years of being a teenager uh, when you're not you know, when you know what it is you should want, um, or at least that, that's how it was years ago, knowing what you should want and, and being confused by what it is you might actually want. Or maybe, you know, I mean, I don't want to dwell on this too much, but um, um, because it's not a book about discovering one's sexuality, no, per se. No, it's not. But, but like all my books, there are many sub-themes and subplots, so and, that, and that's one of them. Yeah, and, and that's why it's uh, lots of knots. I mean, <laughs> so um, so we were talking about characters coming back, and I should say that the way in which this this book started, the, the how it came to be, is actually that I really, really wanted to revisit a secondary character in Three Junes, and that character. Uh, was Malachi Burns' mother, Lucinda Burns. Oh, right. And, you know, she was a very, very difficult character for me to create in Three Junes. As I like to say, some characters come to a writer almost like gifts. And I, and I would say that Fenno McLeod, the protagonist of Three Junes, who I know is one of my readers' favorite characters that I've ever created, was a gift to me. I cannot remember bringing him into existence. I did, but, you know, I, obviously I fell into some pretty deep well in my subconscious there. So there are those characters, and then there are characters that you create because they fulfill a role, and they grow on you, and they gain in stature. They take up more of the stage than you thought they would, and one of those characters is Walter Kinderman, the gregarious restaurateur in The Whole World Over, and he is back in this novel as well. But then there are the third kind of character are characters that you must Create because such and such a character has to have a mother or has to have a spouse or has to have a boss. And you really, as a writer, have to muscle those characters into existence. Just, you know, engineer them in a very effortful way. And sometimes what happens is those characters kind of catch on fire. And in the case of Lucinda Burns, I knew that Malachi Burns had a very devoutly Catholic mother something I haven't experienced firsthand. Um, I like to say that my partner is a traumatized Catholic. And when people (laughs) say to me, oh, you mean he's a recovering Catholic, I say, no, he has not reached the recovery stage yet. So that's my experience of of Catholicism. Um, But I did not want her to be a domineering mother or an abusive mother. I wanted her to be a loving mother who, um, although there's a great deal of friction with her son because of her faith, which he does not share, um, is devoted to him in a way. Uh, And and once I, once she came together for me, I really love her. And I remember wishing that I could give her more oxygen in the room, as it were, and I I couldn't. She had a very limited role, um, I mean, a very important role, but a limited role in that novel. And so in the years since, I've often thought, you know, somehow I'd really like to revisit that character. I'd like to write from her point of view. I'd like to see how it is she became the person she was. But I didn't feel that she merited being 
the true protagonist of a book. And that's when I went back and I reread Three Junes, and I found, I rediscovered that secret that is uncovered toward the end of the novel, the box of photographs and letters under Malachy Burns' bed that Fenno MacLeod finds um, that reveal the existence of a child. And I thought, what if I wrote a novel and made that child, as a grown man, the protagonist? And that, that led me back to writing about Lucinda Burns, who, as you know, has a very strong voice in the novel, but it's not her her story, it's Kit's story. And and I really um, I really loved revisiting her and deepening her and uh, and looking at the life of a mother who lost one of her children years and years ago and how that mourning never stops but how life goes on. Uh, and you meet her two other grown children, Malachi's two siblings who are referred to in passing in Three Junes. And that was another thing. I had to very carefully, because I like, to, I like continuity. I'm the person who notices the continuity mistakes in movies. I wanted to be sure that I was faithful to the few things that I had revealed about, or the several things that I had revealed about Malachi Burns' life and his childhood in Three Junes. Um, and so... You know, it, I kept revisiting Three Junes in order to make this book true to that book. And it's funny because, as you say, if Lin- Lucinda was not one of those muses or a character that comes to you in your dreams, she's so complex because of that. Like, two situations th- that arise are the way she treats her husband, who's someone she wasn't necessarily, wasn't necessarily her first pick, um, the way she treats him after his stroke is really interesting and telling. And then the second one is the moment when that woman goes, brushes by her and then stops and tells her what she did to her life. Those, mm-hmm. those two moments were real pivotal because they gave you a new uh, feeling about who this person really was. They mm-hmm. revealed a lot more than, than what I thought she was. Yeah. And you know what's really funny? This, this is odd, but you know what I thought was the most poignant moment in the book? What? In the very beginning when Kit goes to the closet because of the roof leak Mm -hmm. and the wedding dress Mm -hmm. and what happens to it? His wife's wedding dress. Yeah, Yeah. and and the fact that he is thinking, because I've found myself unfortunately in these same situations where he's thinking, when will I tell her? And because it's so I don't know, there's so many things wrong with that moment. And so many of the things that tell you so much about Kit in mm-hmm. one paragraph. Mm. And I don't you did that. And, and I bet you something like that must have happened to you because it couldn't you couldn't have just made that up. Well, <laughs> of course I can. I can make lots of stuff. You can up. lie about everything. Yes, <laughs> I know. Um, you know, n- n- not quite like that. I, you know, I was. Th- I'm laughing because. Kit's part of the novel originally started when, at the very moment that his wife says to him, Get the heck go. out. <laughs> you know, I, I actually love to break all these alleged rules about writing fiction. And, you know, one of the rules, quote unquote, and I teach writing fiction, and one of the things I like to do is I'm a, I'm a myth buster. You do not have to write every day. You don't have to keep a journal. You know, you don't have to write what you know or not only what you know. Write what you want to know and pretend you know more than you do. You know, I have all these kind of you know, alternatives to the to the writing myth. But one is never start with dialogue. Um, and I thought, well, I'm just going to start this novel right when she says go. You know, and that was the first word in quotes, go. You know, I really mean it. It's time for you to go and find and find out what you need to find out. Um, and And then the book went from there. And after, you know, when I turned in the first draft to my editor, she said, this is a very dramatic beginning. She said, but it's like you just plunge us into the deep end of this marriage without our seeing. You know, we want to get to know these characters just a tiny bit better before we hit this moment. And so then I thought, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write the whole story of that day. And that day is going to be the day after Halloween. So they wake up and any parent knows, and this part I sure didn't make up, any parent knows what it's like 
wake up kids after Halloween when, you know, they begged you and they got to eat a whole bunch of candy the night before. They didn't get enough sleep. They probably still got makeup on. Get those children out of bed. Get them to school. Everybody's crabby. So I wrote basically that whole day, and I didn't know what the day would contain, but I thought, so he's been procrastinating on a lot of things, and his wife wants him to get things accomplished. And I kind of envisioned him walking through the house, doing everything late, the end of October, he takes this air conditioner out of the window that should have been taken out a month ago. <laughs> and in our house, the air conditioner goes to an attic, um, a very small, tight attic you can't stand up in. And so I had him taking this air conditioner to the attic. And then I imagined the attic. And then I thought, so what if there's a leak in the roof? And then what if the leak? And, you know, so the thing is, I actually was discovering what was happening as I went along. It was not one of those scenes that I think about a lot before I write it. I was actually, it's like improv. Well, it's like me as a reader, thinking of him, look, you know, because I know the stairs. I know what they look like. I know how they pull down. Yeah, we don't have those stairs, but I always I always loved people's houses who had those stairs and yeah. pull down out of the ceiling. But the problem with those stairs is, like, I kept thinking, if he's lugging the air conditioner up, there, this must be such a pain in the butt. And, you know, if it was me, my back would start hurting, and then I'd be afraid I'd fall backwards in the sharp edge of the air conditioner. <laughs> so I really, I was really into it because <laughs> it was just like, oh, uh, I can just see this is going to happen. And then something else happened, and I thought, you know, how does he get himself in this situation? Just go down and tell her. And then I thought, would I do that? I don't know. Would I? And yeah. um, so those ki- the way you create those kinds of things, I think you really draw the reader in because it is. It does break rules, kind of, you know? It's like that article about you where they say, you know, uh, writers, you know, you, uh, if only I had a deal table and an empty room and uh, fool's cap paper and a quill pen or an air on chair and the fastest computer, and you write at the kitchen table with kids running around, and, y- you know, it's it's a completely it different... It gets harder. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that article, actually, you know, that, that you must be referring to that profile of me in New York Magazine yeah. when I won the National Book Award, which, you know, that was so funny because my publicist called me and she said, okay, so there's a reporter at New York Magazine who really wants to profile you, and the editor said, the only way they'll do it is if you're interesting. So you <laughs> better be interesting. And I remember being told this by my publicist, and then going to meet this reporter at lunch and thinking, oh my God, I have to be interesting. How am I going to be interesting? Well, it turns out that we just really hit it off, and in fact, she and I became friends. Um, and it was a very fun. It, I, it, it just we we really found that we had a lot of lot of things in common, and I really opened up to her. But I was kind of horrified when the article came out, and the first line in that article, I believe, is Virginia Woolf was wrong. Oh God! Yeah. And I'm like, no, you know, Virginia Woolf is this hallowed figure. But what it went on to say is how I at that time hardly had a room of my own. I mean, we I was living with my partner and our two sons in a very small one-bedroom apartment, and there was one table, and that was the table that we ate on, and the table my children did their homework on, and it was the table I wrote on. And boy, did I not have a room of my own. Um, so um, so it was a cute way to start the article, I guess. Yeah, it um, was. It, and, yeah. and, you know, it, it, again, that breaks rules, too. That's why I brought it up. It's just not the way that um, other writers, at least, you know, I've interviewed 140 authors and they all have different ways of writing, but most of them are by themselves. They get up at whatever. They either get up at 5 o'clock in the morning or they start writing at midnight. Oh, uh, those people, those <laughs> 5 o'clock in the morning people. And they write 5,000 words in one day <laughs> and they, you know. <laughs> no, I go entire weeks, even a month without getting to add new words to whatever I'm working on. But, you know, I always say it. I have to be, my characters have to go everywhere with me in my brain you know a, the lion's share of writing fiction is really daydreaming or yeah. constructive dreaming i mean it's 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 you know as i like to say i i want to marinate in the in my characters lives and and then you know i'll get to the i'll get to the computer and um get those words onto that screen yeah it's like it's like einstein at the institute of higher studies in princeton what did he do? He, he sat there, <laughs> you know, and and that's all he had to do. He didn't need a blackboard. He didn't need a pencil. He just did these thought experiments in his mind. And I think that's very true. I don't think, I think putting the words down on the paper is um, 
prob I guess it's probably the easiest part because the rest of it is actually like you were talking about, you know, thinking what would what if there was a leak, you know, just that's, you know, what I mean talking about there's a key time where you go what if there was a leak. Yeah. And that's what creates a book. And that's it. You know, you're writing along and I think, well, what if this and what if that? Um, and, and it, you know, there are wonderful writers who map things out. Uh, and there are wonderful writers who write very swift drafts. You know, I, I always laugh when some writer friend of mine says, well, I just finished the sixth draft of the novel. Oh, God. Because I write really slowly. I go forward and back and forward and back. Because I'll get hung up on a sentence. I mean, I'm the writer who will sit there and spend half an hour changing an adjective over and over. I, you know, I cannot really go forward too far until I'm pretty happy with what I already have. I mean, that it, it'll change again and again, but every time I open my computer to write, I start by reading what I most recently wrote, and I can get stuck there for a couple hours and not write something new. So by the time I reach the end of the novel, I'm really just about finished. You know, I, I usually won't reach that final chapter, e even a draft of it, for two years. Of course, what this means is that the earlier you are in my novel, the more that's been read over. But, you know, in the end, I read it over and over and over as a whole. But but I don't have drafts. And also, like like you were talking about, you can do whatever you want. If you think of what if there was a leak and then you write it and you go, you go oh, that doesn't work, and then it just goes away. So it doesn't yeah, I mean, have to stay there. You know, the beauty there. of fiction writing is it's private, so you can make a fool of yourself um, and delete it. Uh, and in fact, when Fenno McLeod, the protagonist of Three Junes, came back in my second novel, I really hadn't intended for that to happen, but I was writing about the exact same neighborhood in the West Village in New York, which was the neighborhood I lived in at the time. And I suddenly thought, oh, you know, here's this character with a restaurant on Bank Street, and, you know, that's exactly where Fenno McLeod's bookshop is. So in this world, they would know each other. And, and they both have dogs. So suppose they met because they were both walking their dogs. You know, what if their dogs introduced them? And then I started writing that, and I stopped and thought, no, wait a sec. You know, why am I doing this? Is this a crutch because I'm afraid of leaving that world behind, the world of Fenno McLeod? But in the end, it worked. Uh, I mean, Fenno is a secondary character in that novel, but he's in the background for most of the book. But um, you can experiment. I mean, what, you know, I tell my, my fiction writing students that there's a reason that fiction writers don't have to be board certified, like architects or surgeons. They don't have to pass a bar. And it's this simple reason. You can't kill anybody. You know, the worst you can do is make somebody waste $25 or a couple hours of their life. You, you know, you, the building is not going to fall down. You know, the, you're not going to take out the wrong organ. You, you are involved in an enterprise that you can do any way you want. You might not succeed at it. You know, maybe you won't have readers, but you can do it any way you like. And, and that's an amazing privilege. But it's also a very healthy outlook that lots of people don't share. They ruminate, they have anxiety, they have worry, they have regret after they're done. And it's really, it's, it's, Easy well, for if you, you to think say. I don't have anxiety <laughs> after I'm done, I have anxiety all the time. That's why I'm a fiction writer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, true. If you didn't have anxiety, you wouldn't have anything to write about. Right. Because you don't want to write a novel where everything happens perfectly. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, where did you come up with the idea of, I mean, there was a parrot at the beginning, and there's still a parrot now. But where did you say, okay, what if there were a parrot? Did you do that? So you're asking me about Three Junes here, because, of course, that's the, where, yeah. the parrot Felicity, um, you know, in a way, is a character in yeah, the three Yeah, I was, I was just going to say and the same thing. She, and so ten years later, you know, when you meet Fenno McLeod in the in the whole in um, sorry in End of the Dark Sacred Night, uh, it's ten years since you last saw him, and he still has the parrot. Parrots live a long time, uh, so Felicity is there, but she's she's not as colorful or prominent a feature in this novel. You know, when I was writing Three Junes, and again, this is something that just found its way into the novel. I had been doing volunteer work in the uh, AIDS community in the late 1980s and early 1990s in, in the West Village, and I worked for an organization that helped people with 
AIDS, which back then was called AIDS slash ARC. Um, it, we helped people take care of their pets so they didn't have to give them up. Oh. So we had volunteers who would change litter boxes because, you know, people with suppressed immune systems cannot handle, you know, cannot change litter boxes or aquariums. Um, and my department in the organization was to provide emergency backup care for dogs so that if someone had to go into the hospital suddenly, I would be able to find a place for that dog to stay. Basically what I had to do was twist the arms of all my dog-loving friends to be willing to foster care a dog for an unlimited period of time. Now, because this was back in the 1980s, before the protease inhibitor cocktails, um, pretty much everybody, all the clients that we had were on AZT and those very uh, rudimentary, those early drugs. And, you know, not only were they not in good health, but they were suffering incredible side effects from those drugs. And I had gone into this work because I was a pet journalist. That's actually how I started as a writer. I, was a, um, I wrote about pets. And I, I was terrified at first because what I hadn't realized is that in going and meeting these dogs and, and, um, and meeting their owners, often I would end up sitting in somebody's living room just listening to them talk for a long time about what they were going through. And I thought, you know, I'm not a social worker. This is, this is terrifying. But, you know, in the end, I, I was able to, to do that. And, um, and I have some pretty extraordinary memories from, from that time in my life. And w one thing that, we, that I learned um, was that it, the one pet that people with AIDS could not keep was a bird. Birds. Um, carry certain uh, what are called zoonotic or infections or uh, bacteria that can cross a species barrier and make someone with a compromised immune system very ill, um, particularly uh, respiratory issues. So you have to you had to give up a bird. And I went to the apartment of a young man to meet his dog, and he had a parakeet, and he said to me you know, do you know anybody who wants a parakeet? Because my doctor said I have to get rid of my parakeet. And at the time, my sister was a veterinarian in Boston with a, actually with a specialty in exotics practice. She had a lot of bird patients. And I called her up, and she found home for that parakeet. And I drove that parakeet up to Massachusetts, and my sister placed that parakeet in a home. And then, you know, within about two months, that man died, as many of our clients did. And but I'd never forgotten him, and I, and somehow when I was writing this novel, Three Junes, which I started out by thinking was a father-son story, I thought it was really about Paul McLeod and his son, Fenno McLeod, and then all these other characters began to emerge, including this music critic, and I thought, how would I bring these two very different men together? Because that's what I wanted to do. I wanted Malachi Burns to be this agent of change in Fenno McLeod's life, and I thought about the bird. I thought, well, but let's have it be a really colorful parrot um, that he has to give up. And Fenno loves birds, and so Fenno ends up taking in this bird but maintaining a relationship with the bird's owner, and that's, you know, what changes his life. Uh, so, it's uh, so that's how Felicity came to be, was, you know, out of this pocket of my life that didn't really feel connected to my writing. But in the end, you know, everything finds its way into into one's writing. It's you interesting know. because you know how sometimes in, in men, well, you meet somebody at the end of something when it would have been so much nicer if you met them earlier. Mm. And you yeah. know, sometimes they're like someone who's 60 or 70 meets someone who's 30 or 40 and they both know that had they the 70 year old been 20 years younger and the 20 year old been 20 years older, they would have been perfect whatever soulmates. And mm -hmm. It's a very interesting kind of, um, again, very poignant kind of feeling. Nothing you can do about it, but it's there nonetheless. Right. And, and that's something that in, in this new novel I delve into, um, again, more deeply than I thought I would. But because part of this novel is from Fenno McLeod's point of view, uh, he, and because although Malachi Burns has been dead for decades, uh, he comes back into his life through Kit Noonan, and and he's forced to go back into 
to that part of his past and be more honest with himself than he has been before about exactly what it is that he felt for Malachi Burns during the brief time that they were friends before before Malachi died. Well, Malachi was obviously this, you know, incredibly charismatic character that was brilliant at the same time, c- you know, cynical and sometimes almost mean-spirited. But, um, but then, you know, I, at the beginning I was thinking you're giving short shrift to Jasper. Um, oh! <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, I had this guy in my head, this Rooster Cogburn kind of guy, you know, the heart of gold, gruff exterior, all that. And, but I was thinking, you know, he really, he did a lot of work. I mean, he took good care of him. And it's only at the end where you realize that Kit finally understands that. Yes, don't, now don't give that part away. Did don't I already do it? the very end of the, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a kind of a revelation, I guess. Um, but, you know, yeah, so Jasper is the stepfather that Kit Noonan had from the age of nine when his mother married. Uh, until he was, he went off to college. At which point, his mother left Jasper, uh, in part because she really wanted to become a mother again. And he was a man, he was an older man who'd had two children with his first wife, and he was not going to give her that second opportunity to be a mother. So she ends up uh, remarrying again, um, and Jasper, in a way. Like I talked about Walter Kinderman, the gregarious restaurateur, as I like to call him, from, <laughs> from the whole world over, Jasper was one of those characters that I created because I needed, back, you know, I needed to go into the backstory of Kit Noonan's childhood. Um, his mother was very clear to me. Um, but when I thought, well, what if she had, you know, here's the what if, what if she had married uh, a man who was very stable. And you can see that she she married Jasper, you know, certainly partly out of passion, but also she made a very shrewd choice. She chose a man who was older, established, would be willing to take in her son and take care of him in a loving way in addition to his own slightly older sons. Um, so she made a very practical decision as well as a romantic decision there. So what, as to what kind of a guy Jasper would be these many years later, I didn't have a terribly clear idea until I started writing about him. And I just, it was like falling into a big velvet couch, as I like to say. He was just, he was a character I really relished inhabiting. Well, it's um, like... I, I, for some bizarre reason, I've got it. As somebody said in a review of this book, they said, Julia Glass really gets the geezers right. <laughs> because, you know, my last book, The Widower's Tale, was about a 70-year-old a retired librarian who, you know, may be a kind of alter ego of Jasper's or vice versa. But but Jasper is this, this outdoorsman, uh, runs a, you know, a, a ski and guide shop at a, at a uh, ski slope in Vermont. You know, the irony being here that everybody knows I am so not a skier. I am <laughs> so not a winter sport. I wondered person. about that. You know, my place in winter, by the fire with a book. And a cup of tea, you know, while everybody else goes out like a bunch of fools to skate and snowshoe and so forth. Oh, you know, all my sports are indoor sports. Um, I'm a very indoorsy person, as I like to say. So, um, so it, it would be it, my in-laws are all very active outdoorsy people. You know, my my five siblings-in-law are all uh, certified ski instructors, and you know, they go ice camping and. They climb Mount Washington and bring all their refuse, even their bodily refuse, out in Ziploc bags. <laughs> and, you know, I'm like, who in the world would choose to do that? So they find me very amusing, and I find them very amusing. But I found myself calling on a lot of what I know through my, my winter-loving friends. And, um, and, again, you know, I enjoyed traveling into, you know, creating a world that's pretty different from the world that I with it. Well, there's so many parts of the novel that could have stood alone as short stories, almost like uh, uh, a Jack London story, like in the situation where Jasper and Kit save those two idiots, um, you know, it, during the snowstorm. Yeah. It's almost really like out of a Jack London story. But it could have stood alone as a short story, don't you think? Well, I, I like to think that, but, but that's an interesting idea. I mean, I certainly could have crafted, I suppose I could have crafted it into a short story. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, here you got this guy 
who seems like kind of mean, kind of like, you know, these kids are idiots, but at the same time, there's no question in his mind but that he's going to save them. And then he has this journeyman with him who proves his mettle, you know? And mm -hmm. it's, it's, yeah. it's a cool idea. And, and, and it's I, also, you know, it's the moment, too, though, when Jasper realizes just how old he really is. I mean, here he uh, is yes, right. in his 70s, still fully active outside, and they go out in the dog sled. Um, that was actually a fun bit of research because, well, it should have oh, been yeah. more fun because I thought, you know what, I, I've always wanted to go dog sledding under a lot of blankets, <laughs> you know, with the cup of tea by the fire at the end. Um, and I had read about places that you can go dog sledding here in New England, in um, New Hampshire, in fact, only a couple hours away. The winter that I was involved in writing that book was the only winter in recent years when there's been virtually no snow. And I think it was the winter when all the ski slopes had to make their snow. Oh, yeah. So there was no dog sledding to be had. So what do I do? This is when I discovered just how much you can find on YouTube, that you can go and, and you can be there mushing a dog sled you know, somebody has put a video cam there, so you can see what that's like. And you can find a video that tells you how to train sled dogs. And uh, so I, I had these kind of online dog sledding adventures. Someday I, I actually would like to go dog sledding, but, um, but, for, but I, I didn't have that luxury this time around. And so, um, so that's a part of his life, too, that he, has these, that he maintains this kind of dog sledding business. Plus, the other element of the, if it was a short story, is the fact that, you know, he suffered, he's just suffered a loss with regard to his dogs, you know, and they have to, they have to, you know, mush on without what was their leader, too. And right. That's an interesting element also. Yeah, you really worked that out pretty well when you think about it. Well, you know, I think of Jasper's part of the book as being, you know, perhaps one of the most humorous, because you have in this book several points of view. And, and I must say, St Kit's point of view is a bit of a challenge for some readers yeah. to stay with because he's a man who's depressed. And it's tough writing well, I know. from the point of view of a character who's, who's, who's in a very stuck place without having the reader quit on that character. And so, but, but I think that that's an experience that a lot of people are having these days. Yeah, of, it is. Of feeling very beside the point. Well, the problem is, is that, you know, and I've been there where someone just says, the worst thing is when someone says, can't you just be happy? I mean, what the hell kind of thing is that to say to someone? Right. And, and the other thing is people will just say, hey, Kit, just get over it, okay? Right. Just get over it. You know, what happened? You know, but you have an entire life you got to think about. You know, go out there, just get a job. Yeah, you know? yeah get just a job do it. Home Depot or, you yeah. know, do something. Um, you know, so, so there is his, his psychological paralysis, as it were. That's kind of a strong word. Because, for instance, he's a good father. You know, he's, he's, he's being Mr. Mom. Basically. He's a good father. Well, and, and you really get a feel for the texture of that life. But then, you know, you go from his point of view to Jasper's. And Jasper is a guy who has really lived his life. And he has, you know, I think he has a very endearing, if, somewhat cantankerous point of view on the world. And so the first time I gave a reading from this book, I thought, oh, I'll read the beginning of Jasper's section of the book because Jasper's voice is so, you know, it's very folksy and it's, I think, very heartening and it's very amusing. But the beginning of his part of the book involves putting a dog to sleep. So just, <laughs> at the end of reading this section, I looked out at the audience and people were actually had tears in their eyes and I thought <laughs> oh no you know I, I forgot that so I, I, I don't read that part of the book anymore it's actually hard for me to you know I'd like to read from his part of the book I've been on book tour and I really try to read <laughs> you know just for my own amusement I try to read from different parts of the book but I have not been able to find a part of, of Jasper's part of the book that, that I can well the, can the thing about on. it is is it really is one of the more comic humorous you know okay take it easy here for a couple of pages so yeah, you screwed it up <laughs> reading the wrong part. <laughs> but he is, you know, he's a really funny guy. And then he's got this really wacky screwball kind of romance going on, too. I think I think one of the reasons why people like you so much is you throw all this stuff in there, <laughs> but it works. I mean, and then like Lucinda with Zeke and Zeke's attitude towards his situation. I mean, yeah. where does it all come from? But it all seems to just... It seems like, you know, it's like one of those um, suitcases like Mary Poppins has, 
<laughs> you know, and the hat I like rat, that analogy. <laughs> the hat rack comes out, and then something else comes out, and some of the and what the heck? Or the Marx Brothers in their stateroom, and everyone falls out at the end. But it all just it it all works, and that's why I think your writing is unique. That's why well, why you win the awards. Well, I thank think. you. I mean, I. I love this comparison of my novels to, to Mary Poppins' case. <laughs> if you use that, you need to <laughs> attribute it to me. <laughs> but it, don't you, I mean, don't, don't you see it? It's like a portmanteau bag, you know? It's well, like, there is a lot. I mean, you know... I, there is. And, and I, you know, I love to call myself a maximalist. I, <laughs> you know, and my house, I'm, I'm actually sitting on the front staircase in my house because the, we have these dogs that just never stop barking, and they started barking about... I heard, yeah, I heard the ago, So I moved as far away as possible from the dogs. But in this hallway are these huge, multicolored paintings that I did back in my life as a visual artist in my 20s. And there are a lot of patterns and um, a lot of textures. And, you know, my house is filled with color. Uh, my poor partner, who's a, you know, primarily a black and white photographer, sort of gave up his concept of that, <laughs> you know, of the very austere, everything neutral decor a long time ago. And, you know, I've got a room painted purple and a room painted red. And, you know, for me, they're just sort of, you you know, life needs to contain a lot. I have a lot of friendships. I have, um, you know, I wish I could fit more hobbies into my life. I, you know, I quilt a little bit. I, at one point in my life, I hooked rugs. Uh, and um, and I try to raise my children. Um, but I, but, but that, you know, my life is just very full and my books are very full and my house is very full you're not a hoarder are you are you a hoarder no, you're you poor know, but, partner. I, but i am i i do have a tendency toward clutter uh you know many people would think that there are kind of too many things on too many surfaces in my house and my two boys complain that um you know that it's they can't they're not allowed to throw a ball inside the house because they're going to break something um, but oh I, like in know, the like in the book So, um, but, you know, I'm, okay, so here's another way to look at it, and I think, you know, my books are full of, uh, you know, memory is a very, very uh, important um, element of the stories that I write. How people who have shared their lives, lived together, whether they're siblings or lovers or spouses, the different ways that we remember things, the different ways that we for instance, as children perceive our parents. Um, and I love that, you know, I, it used to be called the Rashomon effect, but I've discovered that nobody thinks of that movie anymore. Um, you know, where you get different views of the exact same situation and, and they're all slightly different. And, and my house is a place that's full of... Dogs. So, you know, it's, well, it's full of dogs. I think they must be barking because the child <laughs> is coming home from school or something. But... Um, Signifiers, maybe. My house is full of cues, that things that remind me of different times in my life. I'm, you know, I guess I might call myself nostalgic, uh, but um, but I like to be reminded constantly of many elements of my past. It's... And when people say, you know, that oh, don't dwell in the past, or you know, that's water under the bridge, which, by the way, is an aspect of of Kit's mother's character in the book. You know, that's not me. I mean, I think that we are always carrying the past with us. And, I know, and it's and always it's, informing. I'm the same way, and my two brothers, it drives them nuts because I hold on to things, not because they're material possessions, but I hold on to them because they remind me of my father. And, and I like to keep them with me, like, like my father's money clip. It's mm -hmm. always on me, and every morning when I look at it, there, there's my father. Right. And I just do things like that. And my brother go, oh, my brother says, well, you mythologize, Dad. And I'm thinking, well, if you're going to mythologize anyone, <laughs> you might as well be your father. And, um, yeah, I tend to do exactly the same thing you do. And and maybe it's wrong. Maybe it's wrong to, to even to go to a graveside and, and talk to someone who's dead. They're not there anymore. God, there, can't, there can't be anything wrong with it. No, that's you not. Know, it's, it, 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 it's for some people and it's not for other people. Right. Um, yeah. You know, but another thing I like to say about the past is if someone says, and I'm by, and I mean someone of a certain age, um, not an 18 year old. 
if someone says to me they have no regrets, you know, I know that either that person um, is very shallow or they're lying because yes. we, we've we all made mistakes in our lives that we wish we could undo. Anybody who hasn't, hasn't lived. And that's, that's something that comes up a lot in my books. I'm very... Um, I'm very interested in what happens when really smart, really good-hearted, well-meaning people make very foolish mistakes in their lives or really, you know, dunderhead choices. Well, what, you know, how do we deal with the consequences? How do you make the choices? I mean, look, I'm... Well, how I'm, do you make the choices and, and what happens when you begin, when you see what the consequences it goes, are? How do you deal with it that? It goes back to your rope. And the thing about it is, yes, I, I'm exactly. a lawyer and I, I practiced law for like 30-some years. And I did divorces until I had the luxury of not being able to do them anymore. And women would come in and say, oh, my husband's such a... And use an expletive. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, was he like that when you married him? And they go, well, yeah, I guess kind of. I'm like, well, what did you marry him for? You know, and, 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 and marriages are probably the biggest example of that, taking that one step that even when you make it, you might know it's the wrong step. Though, that's interesting fodder for novels. Is, oh, yeah. You know, I've written a fair amount about, about marriage. Uh, I mean, I write about all family relationships. Um, and, and I'm very interested in people's families, and not just from a nosy point of view. I mean, by hearing about people's families, you learn a lot about them. And many of my friends are, are both amused and amazed by the way in which I'll keep track of or ask about <laughs> what, their, I mean, what their siblings are up to, what their parents are up to, people I've never met, you know. And I'll, but I'll remember what, you know, what they last told me. Oh, you know, my brother was diagnosed with cancer, and, you know, or, um, you know, his son was just arrested or something like that. And I'll remember that and I'll ask about that and I'll say, you remember that? And I'll say, well, of course I remember that um, because we can't, we can't completely separate ourselves from, from our, even our past families, certainly not from our current families. But and lots of course of people... there's a difference between the family you're born into and the family that you choose to make or the families that you choose to make. Well, yeah, but the basic part is you're listening to someone talking. There aren't very many good listeners well, I'm not always a good listener, but I try. <laughs> well, you know, and that rem- talking about marriage reminds me, I don't understand how anyone could say that about Sandra because I think she's a real trooper, and she she could have just said, get the hell out of here, and I don't ever want to see you again, and she's not saying that at all. She's yeah. leaving the door open completely. So why is anyone, why would anyone think the other? I mean, that's what makes good book well, clubs. Well, you but- know, one thing that I've learned um, is that when readers disagree about your characters, um, you then you've that. really made yeah. three-dimensional characters. So yeah. I, I know, I, I actually have learned to not to agonize when people have, and, and I, this often comes up in book clubs. Right. I love to visit book clubs and listen to people argue about my characters. And, you know, people usually probably withhold what they don't like about my books, although sometimes they'll be very frank with me about what they feel. Not in our book club. In our book club, people almost come to fisticuffs. Come to, oh, well, but if you invite the author, it's different. Oh, so, yes, definitely. Oh, right. yeah, of course. So, of course. No, I, I don't belong to any book clubs. I mean, I visit book clubs as the author coming to visit you so that they can ask me questions about the book. Um, but, I, but one of the things that, um, that interests me about marriage in general, and modern marriage in particular, is, or I shouldn't, interest is the wrong word. You know, I think it surprises me, is how willing adults, married adults are, to throw in the towel when they have children. And I don't mean that you should never get divorced if you have children. Obviously, that's not what I'm saying. But I think I've seen people break up households over what seems to me fairly minor disappointments or unfulfilled expectations. And I think, you know, my personal philosophy is that once you have children, you really raise the bar on that. So were Sandra to say to Kit, you know, I'm sick and tired of your not getting a job. It's been two years now, you know, get the hell out. Then I would think, I would think very little of her. Um, and, and she's a character that I personally admire. I mean, I'd like to know her in real life. Uh, so anyone who says that she should have reached the boiling point that tells me something about that person, that they're fairly intolerant. Um, and so, 
Well, anyone who goes out and gets salt hay, you know, and lugs it into the car and then gets home and her husband is not ready to take the salt hay out of the car and hasn't flushed the toilet after he puts the Drano down it? Come give on. Give me the drain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, Come on, give me a break. Yeah, I see you maintain very high standards in your household. Well, that's not that high. I mean, it's a pretty <laughs> low bar. <laughs> well, he's he's a pretty depressed character. He's la he's, sl he's slothful. He's... He Oh, I guess, I guess. You know, now you're being too hard on him. Well, no, he's not clinically depressed. <laughs> if he was clinically depressed, he'd be in bed having suicidal ideation. There are different degrees of depression. <laughs> there are people who are functional depressive. Um, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's um, well, perhaps I should say he's dejected. You know, he's dejected. You know, he needs to, um, and he does need a boot in the pants. And it, it works. Maybe it doesn't work. Who knows? Maybe, maybe we'll find out. And it's not as if there's some kind of happy, you know, solution. He doesn't... No, there the isn't. End. You know, one of the things, you know, because he's denied tenure, I, I talked... I'm not in an academic situation, but I certainly have friends who are, and I was asking them about, you know, what happens when you're denied tenure? You know, what's usually the career path? And it's kind of sobering. It's, it's kind of scary, actually. I mean, people usually, you know, you become an adjunct professor or whatever, and then or maybe you teach in a private school, but often you end up leaving the academic sector altogether. So what ultimately becomes of Kit, I don't know. Will I write another book involving Kit? Stay tuned. I mean, I always swear I'm never returning to characters, and now I've proven myself a liar. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> De definitely. And I'm engaged in writing another book that so uh, far has completely new characters in it, but it happens to take place in this fictional town called Vigil Harbor, which is the town in which... My last novel, The Widower's Tale, ended. And so... You just love these people and you love these places and you can't help yourself. That's what it is. Well, I get, I get very involved. You know, I do. And, I, and places, by the way, are... Some of the greatest pleasure in being a fiction writer to me is in creating a place. Um, either recreating a real place, you know, be it the West Village in New York or Paris or Vermont or, or a, a fictional place. That, that is a composite, perhaps, of places I've known. Well, that's, I, maybe, I love creating houses. Well, landscape. maybe that's what's so cool about your writing, is you are a builder. You, you know, you're talking about what you are. You are kind of like a builder. You build the place, and then you say, okay, you guys have to come here. Come here now and do this. Right. It's like there are two parts of it. You know, it's the exposition and you know, setting up the town, setting up the places. And you do it, I mean, now that I think about it, think about the book that way you do you there's two things there's the place and then you put all these people in it and they interact thank you so much for, for right. being here and well, then you, and, and then when it comes out in paperback maybe that would be a good time to come down so yeah i'd love to do that okay all we'll, right we'll talk soon great thanks okay. a lot You're take welcome. care you Bye. Too. thanks so much for joining us today on the avid reader talking to julia glass about her new book and the dark sacred night Next week, the avid reader welcomes Maggie Shipstead to discuss her brilliant and dramatic new novel, Astonish Me, which explores the nature of talent and the struggle to balance the demands of art and the difficult choices that must often be made to fulfill the fact that you have an extraordinary gift. So, talk to you next week. You've been listening to the Avid Reader Show with your host, Sam Hankin. Sam will be back next week with reviews and interviews of some of the more interesting books and authors of today.